Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, we know that it's a Thursday, uh, a Friday, Thursday today, and a long weekend. So we're so delighted that you've put the time aside to be with us and to join us this morning. Um, and today's webinar is part of a series that we've been doing on growth. And um, we are very uh, fortunate to be joined by uh, Peter van Eerden today, who is a head of people partnering um, at TrueLayer. Um, Peter and I have known each other for many, many, many years. We've worked through many, many iterations of different businesses um, as they've grown, as they've right-sized, as they've downsized um, over many years. And Peter is really um, a little bit of a different um, HR or um, uh, people partner <clears throat> in that he really both has the strategic vision as well as the opera operationalization skills, but really people are at the core and at the heart of um, uh, Peter's practice um, and his profession. And so we're really, really delighted to have you with us this morning, Peter. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Um, he's worked at um, a lot of different companies as they've grown, as we say, through M&A, through raising investment rounds, through having to downscale, and he's going to join us today just to chat a little bit about the impact on people um, and the risks and opportunities that exist when these various iterations um, of growth happen. So welcome, Peter, and thank you so much for being with us this morning. We're really grateful that you could join us. Thanks, Wanda. It really is a great opportunity to be able to do this. So I really appreciate being invited um, and being able to share a little bit of some of my experiences. Obviously, some of the scenarios we'll talk about, there's some of it which is um, absolutely examples, but some of it is just kind of creating a little bit more, um, not embellishment, but just a little bit more uh, around kind of scenarios. And I've, I've kind of made it to kind of create some extremes of situations rather than necessary absolutes of my experience, but certainly these are things that will play out in explaining how that ends up impacting on people. But I really appreciate being able to do this. It's been, it'll be great to, to be able to share my experience. Great, thank you so much. So Peter's gonna take us through um, three scenarios today. Uh, we invite you to please be as interactive as you can. <clears throat> Post your questions, we'll answer them as we go along. There will also be a question section at the end where we'll take everybody um, bring everybody into the room with us and stop the recording. Um, so please be aware of um, some Chatham House rules when we do do that. Um, and we invite you to ask any tough, difficult um, questions that you might not want to ask um, uh, openly uh, in the chat or Q&A uh, sections on the, on the website. And please, yeah, post comments or your thinking in the chat as we go along. So Peter, maybe you want to kick us off and tell us a little bit about, um, take us through these three scenarios that you've painted for us based on your experience um, and, and, and what you uh, would recommend. Before we do that, we want to just go into a Zoom um, and we want to get an idea of kind of who's in the room. So the Zoom question is, the, the poll question is, uh, who's looking after your people function? and what influence do they have? Um, so there's some options here. They are, we have an HR person, but they're fairly junior. Uh, we don't have an HR person. We have an HR person who is fairly experienced. You can take us where you wanna be. We have an HR person, but they do not have much influence and don't sit on the board or the senior leadership team. Great, so we don't have an HR person or we have an HR person who's fairly experienced and who can take us, so kind of 40% and 40%, so a nice split between we do have someone that can take us to where we want to be or we don't have a person at all. Uh, and then 20%, we have an HR person, but they don't have much influence. So I'm sure, Peter, that you've seen all of the iterations of those three. Um, we don't have anybody at all, or we do have, I know I certainly have in my HR consulting years, uh, we either don't have anyone, or we've got someone, um, but they really don't have much influence. Um, uh, or we've got someone that we feel confident can take us to where we want to be. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that, everybody. That's great. Brilliant. Um, that's super helpful. I think that gives me a little bit of an idea of where 
everyone is at who's on the call. Um, so I think let's let's may maybe move on to kind of the first uh, scenario, but let's just talk, what we're going to talk about are three quite different ones. Uh, one is a situation where there's an acquisition, and I'll go into a bit of detail about each of these scenarios. Um, then it's about gr growing quickly. And then the last one is about growing and then unfortunately closing. Um, so these are very different scenarios and we can see how the different uh, examples and, and situations play out and impact on people. And I think just given the responses today is to think about how your organization and how, whether there is an HR person or whether it's a leader, how you, you might want to think about these different scenarios as it may be applicable in some shape or form um, and how that plays out to what, what do you do how do you handle situations and how do you work with people in the organization? And do you need some support along the way is probably the things that I would keep in my mind. Beautiful, Peter. One of my favorite quotes, all time favorite quotes is by Lawrence Bossidy and it's this one. And it says, at the end of the day, you bet on people and not on strategies. So all the best strategies in the world <clears throat> and as much risk analysis as you may choose to do, um, you're betting on the people. And that's so much about their felt experience and what they go through um, day to day. So, Peter, I'm going to hand over to you to take us through scenario one. Cool. Brilliant. So um, scenario one, we've got company X. Uh, it has five and a half thousand employees spread across 30 countries with a headquarters in the USA. Uh, there is company Y, has 400 employees in four countries and has a headquarter in the UK. Company X has a profit margin of 50%. Company Y has a profit margin of 15%. Company X has a zero risk tolerance. Company Y takes risks and encourages employees to take calculated and sometimes high stakes risks. Company X has a top 10 most recognized brand in the world. Company Y has a strong brand, but this is a B2B brand. Company Y has a product that company Y, as a company y values as key to their success and company X decides to acquire company Y. So just kind of think carefully through those different areas or uh, characteristics of the scenario. And I'd really like to hear from you um, about what opportunities and what threats might exist in a scenario like this. I'm gonna go into ones that I've observed and I'm sure there will be more uh, that we can think about, but maybe just a start point uh, would be have a think about what opportunities and threats there might exist in a scenario like this. Feel free to add on the chat. There we go, cultural differences. Great, yeah. Matt. Plenty of careers open to I. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Nick. Great. Super. Super. Well, why don't we move on to the next slide and kind of um, I think some of those very good uh, examples that you've just shared will, will be there. So uh, these are just a few, and by all means, there are plenty of different ones. So let's let's look at the opportunities to start with. So acquiring company buys a product they need. So they've obviously identified a specific product. Now, I, I do think with a lot of these opportunities and threats, you could probably see them from different perspectives, depending on where you sit, whether, you, whether you're in the acquired or acquiring company. Um, so so what, when we speak specifically about a product that they need, um, it might be only one subset of products. So if you imagine you're being acquired and I have this product that this company who's acquiring us wants, what about the other products? And how do people feel about it when all the company, the acquiring company focuses in on is this other product that they're interested in. And the cultural impacts, the, the potential impacts as we see can play out in that. So, so there's this hyper-focus on one, one product that's offered is, is a great opportunity because this is an amazing thing that they want, but it might also at the same time be one that has a potential impact on the rest of the organization. Um, the acquired company sees this uh, incredible benefit of being a global brand. And um, if I'm an individual and I kind of, I'm in a B2B brand, uh, when I'm a consumer brand like, like this one, 
and you're at, you're in the top 10, you're hugely visible. And from a personal perspective, you're kind of thinking, oh, this will look great on my CV, or this will look great in terms of my experience and opportunities. This is a much larger, larger organization. So it creates this massive, massively different world from what you might have been used to. So huge, huge impact and potential impact on people. Um, then from the acquired company, it might be from a business point of view, this incredible opportunity to access new markets, cross-selling opportunities. Um, but in doing that, that also creates career opportunities. So on, at an individual level, um, that's, that's a fantastic opportunity. Potentially, and uh, let's move on to some of the threats, um, potentially cultural differences. So a US organi based organization versus a UK based organization, as much as they might be similar, they, they, they for sure will be differences around how we lead, how things are run. Um, and that's not a right or wrong, it's just a point of difference. And then I think you, I think it was Matt um, who said, and I, Matt or Nick who said about the risk tolerance. And this sits within the paradigm of culture. And if you look at it one extreme to another, and that is a hugely difficult thing to overcome because you have a nimble organization like the acquired one, which can make changes, do things quickly, being acquired by a company that says almost zero, uh, pretty much zero risk tolerance uh, because of brand impacts um, most likely. And so they have to be very, very, very careful around reputational risk and, and damage to brand. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's how do you navigate that? And that's where kind of these potential threats come in. Um, in this scenario, what I haven't kind of portrayed is about integration or alignment. So as much as a decision was made uh, in this instance to acquire a business, then a decision has to be made about how do you integrate that business or you don't. And this plays out in multiple different ways. Pretty much every uh, acquisition is a little bit different, but sometimes you'll be left alone. And sometimes you'll be fully integrated and sometimes there's a bit of partial integration and, and that happens, uh, you know, over a period of time. In this example, there was no integration for about 18 months, which created in itself uncertainty because you were going to see the fact that, hey, you're part of this organization, but you're not really part of it. Um, and when you have people based in similar locations, um, the treatment of people becomes different. Policies and processes are not the same. So being able to move people across from one part of the org as part of internal mobility, which most organizations would want to encourage, it became really quite challenging to do so. Um, and so eventually after about 18 months, th there was a big decision to integrate um, these two, two organizations more fully, branding change, all these other good things that come with the benefit alignments from a, from a people perspective. So let me Beautiful. stop there. Yeah. So Beautiful, thing, Peter. Anything else on that? Yeah, I mean, there's just, uh, thank you. Those are super high level. And I'm sure that we could delve into one of these and do a whole webinar just on cultural differences, you know, or just on um, uh, integration and alignment and how that happens. Um, uh, obviously, I have um, an idea of, of uh, which uh, m a this was um and and certainly there were a lot of complexities from a people perspective um uh, as you mentioned uh, you know the acquired company was super nimble and had developed this product out of being really highly innovative and that innovation required a high risk appetite um and um, an ability to fail um the company that had acquired them was a very large, stable um, uh, financial services kind of company and um, and certainly brand, reputation, um, all of those uh, kind of risks were very, very real for them. Um, and so I think there were a lot of challenges about moving things along even, you know, um, because they were now uh, later on post-integration, there were now all these layers and that produced huge frustration. Um, for people on the ground, um, trying to innovate and, and move things along and improve and uh, continue to uh, be nimble. Uh, and that, and that they encountered a lot of challenges there. One thing, Peter, I'd like to maybe you can that maybe you can touch on is, um, and I'm going to ask this through each scenario, is um, what do you think uh, the felt experience was um, 
you know, you were in, um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think you were in the acquired company part initially before um, integration. Um, what do you think the felt experience was uh, for people on the ground? Um, and I'm sure it was different for everybody and it, it would certainly have been a very personal experience. But if you looked at the overall sentiment, um, you know, talk us through that wave of, of how things went uh, pre and post integration. For sure. And obviously pre-integration, there were a limited number of people who were aware of what was going on and for due diligence pur purposes, for legal reasons and all of those types of things. Um, so there was a very small subset of people who were aware of what was what was happening. Um, and from my recollections at that time, it would have been quite a surprise. I don't think people were, were very much aware that we were even looking at a sale at that point in time. So there was no kind of lead up generally for the average person in the organization to know that. Uh, when it got announced, so there was kind of a, hey, we let people internally know, and then there was kind of media coverage and all the other things that went with it. There was a huge expectation, particularly given the size of brand about what that would mean for an individual to the point of, um, you know, I'm going to see a material benefit immediately. And, and that was what people felt. They felt, okay, I've got this massive brand. Now I'm going to get all the stuff. And the reality was that integration didn't happen initially. So it, it, was, it happened 18 months later. So there was this period of time where people were, okay, now what? And, and so a lot of work that had to be done uh, to help people transition that expectation to reality over that period um, was really, really challenging because it was an, a, a new acquisition, even for the acquiring company they hadn't done it before. So, so this was a brand new situation for them too. So there was lots and lots of learning on both sides about how this is felt for pe individuals. And, mm. and the acquiring company was huge like they were incredible about stuff and they really wanted people to feel comfortable cared for and thought about so it wasn't like you know any situation here where there was a an intensity of not trying to do that that it's the combination of decisions and how that impacts and then realizing how those decisions impact on people directly mm -hmm. um and that was really what kind of people felt is this, hey, wow, brilliant. I'm so chuffed about this, so excited. Expectations are incredibly high. And then actually very little changed mm. for a good period of time. And so we needed to create success stories during the course of that period for people to feel, oh, this is happening. This is real. This is going to benefit me and my team and my uh, my department. Um, and, and make a difference. We did experience the support of being able to grow during that period. And that was a great part is that actually, yes, we kind of left to our own devices, we can grow, wonderful. So people did experience positive stuff out of it, but the expectation of what they might've received because of the brand positioning versus what the reality was, was not the same. Mm. And, and that had to be managed. And, and honestly, I, I don't know how much thought went into that at that point in time. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's just uh, such a beautiful point, uh, you know. And I mean, being such an innovative organization, you had some amazing talent. You know, you had some really incredible uh, people in the team at that time. And I'm wondering, um, you know, one of the risks might have been that that those people um, uh, might have considered leaving. Um, and I'm sure that there potentially were some people that just thought, sure, I don't know if I can be part of this um, huge organization. I'm not sure if that's for me. Um, and also, uh, you know, that expectation differential, right? So my expectations are here and now we're six months in and nothing's happened and I'm just feeling completely disillusioned, you know, and kind of and meeting that gap. So it'd be really interesting to hear a little bit about how you manage the potential risk of losing the top talent that you had, that it actually brought you to a point of being able to be acquired in the first place. Totally. And I, look, there's... there's as part of any normal due diligence process and pre-acquisition, you identify those critical talents and critical people that need to be retained effectively in order to do that. And usually an acquiring company um, will, part of the deal is that that 
those individuals are identified and incentivized in some shape or form to be able to kind of stick around. So, so, so that's a key thing that would happen in certainly in the acquisitions that I've been I've been involved with. That's that's been really really key. But the kind of the other point I think you're alluding to as well is about a personal decision for an individual to go and say, hey, I like the nimble, high risk or higher risk environment versus a lower risk environment. And and I think it's to to naturally understand that every like you have a bit of a shelf life in organizations based on your pers personal preference. And so if things fundamentally change, we 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 can accept that we will lose some people along the way. Um, as you know, and, and so it's always a tricky balance because these are great talent, but if they're not comfortable and happy in, in the environment that they flourish in, then then sometimes you end up parting ways. And 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 so that does that is a reality of of acquisitions because usually you're you're bringing two different culturally uh, culturally different organizations together um, but these things 100 percent do happen but we have to look at ways to keep people around and happy and and engaged beautiful thank you so just having gone through some of the opportunities and threats i'm interested to know from people on the call and maybe you can post in the chat um <clears throat> what uh having given this given the discussion that we've just had is there anything that stands out for you now about other potential and opportunities or threats that maybe we haven't um, covered here or that maybe has come up for you now post our little bit of a discussion um, about this uh, M&A. And I'd love to um, hear from people what they think. Is there anything else that you can think of? Yeah, Peter, it's, uh, it's been a wild ride, right? Um, over the years. Um, through all of the many differ different iterations. Uh, most M&A we do has a tight integration plan phased on commercial and risk priorities. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Helpful, uh, Peter, in your experience to have a really good tight uh, integration plan? 100%. Absolutely. Mm. And I, I, my experience is that not everyone sees those things as important. It's, mm. it's it, you know, even smaller scale ones. Um, I, I do think that, you know, the, and especially as you start to think through, and, and this is not necessarily through companies I've worked for, but certainly through my, my discussions with others around smaller scale or growing organizations, there's not necessarily the experience of what an in integration would look like um, and understanding the commercial aspects, as rightly said, the risk um, priorities, but also the people priorities. Mm -hmm. So then it's it's kind of how do we deal with all of those things in a, a carefully thought through plan? Um, and that doesn't always happen. Um, yeah, that's so a beautiful point. So just such a beautiful point there. You know, um, Nick has highlighted your commercial and risk priorities, but um, there's massive, massive uh, people priorities as well. And I think that those often get ignored. You know, this um, this idea of how we're going to manage change for people and for the felt experience of people, you know, um, all change is um, whenever there is change, there is always loss and people will always have those two sides of the coin. You know, what am I gaining, but also what am I losing? Um, and that experience of loss can be quite profound for people. Um, yeah. Matt, where communication around integration is low, people can make their own assumptions. Some good and some bad. Yeah, hundred percent. Absolutely. I, you know, again, I, I, the communication part is that's Matt. You're hundred percent right. It, it's got to be consistent. It's got to be ones that explain the why part. I think often, um, and again, just my experiences of things, start to explain the why to people, and it helps them to move forward um if you just say this is what we're doing that's helpful to a certain extent but giving them a bit of the why is is often really really helpful and again i'm not suggesting that others on the call don't do that but based on my experiences for sure that's been very very helpful to to employees going through you know these types of scenarios it's like why did we do that what is the impact and how could that benefit the org teams you etc and kind of taking them through that that kind of experience and having that as part of a formal integration plan is really key so you know communication is fundamental to that integration plan beautiful shall we move on to scenario two yep 
Okay, so again, um, these scenarios are not all <laughs> my own experiences, but based, based on some of my experiences and not all um, actual things. So, so please just do take that into consideration. So company A has 200 employees based in two countries. Uh, company A has four primary investors. Uh, company A has a small board of directors. They've successfully raised funding to support a growth strategy, driving commercial and product activities. Uh, commercial uh, Company A decides to add a third location and circa 200 people. 12 months on, the CEO and founder announces that they have been extremely successful and employees have done a brilliant job. Revenue and costs are high. Um, Company A investors are now not so happy that the growth has resulted in spiraling costs. Company A has to make the call to cut 180 headcount following a few weeks previously announce announcing major business success. Company A right sizes and focuses on sustainable growth. Okay, so again, we're gonna look at exactly the same approach. We're gonna look at opportunities and threats and I'd love to hear back from you, your thoughts on, on this scenario and potentially what could the opportunities and threats be, and particularly with that people lens. Yeah, it's a super interesting one, this, Peter, because this is actually what happens in tech a lot. <laughs> you know, this rapid, rapid, rapid growth, right? Um, and we see it um, uh, a lot of companies where it is a, this kind of badge of honor, right? Oh, we've tripled our headcount, you know, in 18 months. Um, and and then just around the corner, you hear, oh, we've had to uh, right size or downscale. And it seems to be uh, really, really, really prevalent. And um, this, um, we grow, 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 grow. Oh, we've overgrown. Oh, we grow, 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 grow. Oh, we've overgrown. And I think that in and of itself um, um, just has a real, real impact on the people in the business. Um, so I'd love to hear, anybody got any thoughts on, uh, what opportunities and threats might look like in this particular scenario? I'd be very, very keen to know. It's uh, it's one that I certainly have encountered in the last twenty five years, many, many, many times. Crisis in leadership, Sarah. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Underwhelming eco or founder. Profitable growth, CEO. Yeah, yeah. Can the founder uh, really uh, stay in that? Right? Can the founder really? Is the founder really equipped? Is the founder really equipped? Um, and this is often, often we see here this oscillation of um, at this point sometimes founders really, really, or CEOs really, really falter. Um, and sometimes this is when investors actually say, oh, we, need an, uh, we need a heavy hitter. We need a more experienced CEO to come in. And this is sometimes where we see founders actually step out. And that can be absolutely massive for organizations. Absolutely massive. Uh, can have huge, huge impacts. Matt says, mismatched messaging around growth, success, and cutbacks. Yeah. Mismatch messaging, 100%. We're growing, we're growing, growing, growing. Oh, no, no, we're cutting back. No, 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 we're very successful. Oh, we're, we're, we're trenching. So I think that there's a, that kind of oscillation is, is huge. Stepping back high costs equals high risk. So too many risks. I'm guessing a priority to spend the funding uh, rather than <laughs> grow to plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, absolutely. How much can we spend, right? Oh, we have all this money, which we've been struggling. We've been struggling with before. So let's just hire like crazy. True. Great, Peter. Maybe you want to take us through the ones that you identified. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, the ego boost of success. This is a fantastic story. We're growing. We're doing all the right things. There's great opportunities. This is a fantastic, you know, impact on business morale, um, on the commercials, although we did see the, the concern about the spiraling costs. And this is all relative, right? So, um, you know, spiraling costs might still be, hey, we're still growing we're in the right direction, but we are a little bit concerned that, hey, the costs are a little bit out of hand. Um, building strong leadership capabilities is something that um, you kind of think through these scenarios is, 
is fundamental opportunity in this. It's like, how do we deal with the, the upside and the downside? Um, it Through that huge growth, it definitely provides growth and career opportunities. Um, you know, bringing in 200, 400, whatever it might be in a very short space of time, you, you can't do that without the people that are already there and helping you to deliver that growth because they are the, one with the, the ones with the institutional knowledge. So kind of my, my experience of this is you've got to be able to focus on that and you've got to give people the opportunity to do it. Um, not everyone will be perfect at it and you've got to give them room to grow, but um, it's fundamental to, to kind of how the opportunity might exist for people. Um, overall, kind of it's, it, it's a great story part, particularly the growth story, less so obviously kind of where you end up downsizing. Um, but if we look at the, the kind of threats on this, um, we're stretching existing teams while growing in a very short space of time. So kind of impact on people, potential exhaustion and burnout, which is very, very real for people. Um, the recognition that people in an org of maybe 50 to 100 might not be best for an organization of 300 to 400 or 5,000 or whatever it is. So again, kind of that culture shift that exists um, as time goes on. And the threat of not investing in leadership and management development is absolute. The first thing to go out the door in spend is this, when we start to look at costs. However, in a growth scenario, when you're still growing, this is fundamental to build in. And often what I've experienced, and again, on multiple occasions, is how important the need for, for developing people and leaders to help you build success as an organization. And often I've seen <laughs> where the best person at the job gets promoted into the lead role, the management role, and that's not necessarily the right thing to do. Um, they might, you know, it might be that they end up growing and, and being more capable, but it's not necessarily true. And, you know, leading a team takes a, a lot of skill. Uh, I'm a, of the belief it can be learned. There are some people who naturally lead and there are people who maybe naturally don't, but can learn to do so. Um, and for this, I, it's a huge threat. If you don't invest in that, it, it really is a long-term potential risk. It's something that can really fail the culture of the organization. Um, and, and I've seen it happen. It's like, you know, we don't do enough. Um, you know, I think I look back and I think, oh, I wish we'd done a bit more. We did some, but not enough. Um, mm. And it just kind of really from a from a culture impact as a potential long term to do more damage if it's not invested in. Hundred so, percent. Yeah. It's just I just want to comment quickly on your your um, your observation there about um, that sometimes the people who do the job really really well and are experts in doing the job really really well. And our specialists in doing the job really, really well and have a lot high degree of skill in doing the job are not always the best people to be leading the team. Sometimes they don't even want to lead the team, but the only way that they feel that they can move up in the organization is to step into a leadership role. And that doesn't often serve them. So what I found quite useful there is to think about progression frameworks that maybe don't necessarily mean that people have to move into leadership in order to move up in the organization. And that can be super, super helpful to kind of map out, right? Um, because not everyone uh, wants to um, or um, um, maybe best to lead uh, the team just because, just purely because they're really, really skilled. And often those appointments are made because they are the most senior, the most skilled person in that team. Definitely. Um, so in terms of other impacts on people, I'm not sure if anyone has any other thoughts on this, but um, otherwise we can move on to the kind of third scenario. Cool. So growth scenario is not a growth scenario <laughs> per se, unfortunately. Um, so this is growing then closing. And, and we kind of, uh, this is a, a different look on, on, on scenario two in that the company here, company B has 180 employees based in three countries, has a single investor, has a small board of directors, but for regulatory reasons, has these over two countries. Um, company B acquires a FinTech in Europe Company rebrands to cover two major products. 
It agrees with board and investor to add 120 new headcount by the end of the year. Uh, Company B experiences massive headwinds following a successful year of growth. Silicon Valley Bank, crypto, cost of living crisis, investor confidence drops, war in Ukraine, the perfect storm. Company B investor determines to withdraw investment. Board determines only viable action is to shut down. So this one, again, uh, following that same format, if you can have a think about opportunities and threats in this scenario, and this is again on, on people. So what, what are the impacts of opportunities and threats for people? Yeah, I mean, sometimes, you know, we can plan as much as we uh, think that we can, Peter, and these headwinds just kind of come out of nowhere, right? Um, and I think, uh, I mean, there's some very obvious uh, risks in this scenario. I'll be really keen um, uh, to find out uh, from people what they can see here as really obvious risks um, for this kind of scenario. And super tough, right? Super tough again from an expectation perspective. People are thinking, "Yay, we're heading new. You know, we're we're enhancing our headcount. We're going to be hiring. We're not going to be doing five people's jobs anymore. I'll be able to get some support, some support in my role." Um, and it can turn around just so so quickly in some circumstances. Uh, Nick says, "Worth examining MBO opportunities." Uh, very hard to say without context. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Anyone else have any thoughts? The health of everyone involved. Finding alternative funders. Is it profitable? Yeah. Good question. Should we? Yeah, take us through on? it. Cool. Take it through it, Peter. All righty. So impact on people. Um, and maybe just to to maybe contextualize, um, profitable, no, um, in, in, in this scenario, in the context of this, this specific scenario. Um, and that kind of does have an impact. Do we, did, did the organization look at other investment opportunities? Yes, um, but kind of not necessarily with a lot of timing available. Um, and given the headwinds and investor confidence, it was really difficult to, to find alternative investment. Um, so, so opportunities, uh, learning and developing resilience. So, given a scenario like this, um, it's it it people learn to be a little bit more resilient when everything's working um, and then it's not, um, or everything's working and something massive changes. Um, helping to build an understanding of when things go wrong. So, the opportunity to actually work through a scenario where things fundamentally shift and this would have been a big shift because you're going through growth and then unfortunately you're in a situation where you're potentially forced into a, sh a shutdown or wind down scenario um for some people there might be the experience of uh going through a wind down um a closure which not is not probably great experience but it's something to experience and that has value because it allows people to understand, hey, are there potential uh, flags that um, we need to consider in my next role uh, or experience and say, I've learned from the scenario, let's do maybe things differently or, or I, I can pick up things earlier than I might have anticipated before. Um, and then the threats effectively, uh, burnout is a big, big threat here. So, um, you know, people going through situations like this particularly in, in people functions, um, you know, the pressure that exists on, on people teams in a situation is, is extreme um, because they bear a lot of the emotional uh, experience of people. Um, and so, you know, often they're the individuals that they end up, you know, an average employee will go and chat to. But obviously there's this job loss situation, the impact on individuals and their families, a loss of confidence um, in the organization, um, a loss of trust potentially, loss of credibility and leadership um, because you've gone from, how did you go from there to there? Um, and actually in this scenario, there's a lot of this has to do with a, a, a literally perfect storm rather than anyone doing something wrong. Um, it's, it's specifically more about, hey, we can't always predict the situation. These things happen, and it, and it can be in some stages, you know, 
an unfortunate one where it winds down and and risks you know also single investor um you know what was that something that um we, you think about differently and you kind of have to look at different options maybe that wasn't an option in the scenario so uh, certainly i would be looking at you know what other things could you learn from from the scenario would be well what else could we mitigate our risks um and the risks for sure could be you've got one point of failure if you don't have funding from that what where else do you get funding from um and so so that becomes a key key thing but ultimately you know where we are trying to focus is kind of how does this impact on on people and uh you know there's an there's an immediate impact um as soon as communication starts to happen around these things and um you know, there's there's a whole lot of activity that ends up doing this. And, you know, my biggest concern in a situation like this would be around the kind of burnout, job loss, impact on families, um, you know, the credibility stuff that potentially you would have built up is now kind of being unfortunately broken down. So so there's lots of things that you can take out of a scenario like this, um, but it is one that is, is quite challenging um, and certainly has a big impact on people. Yeah, 100%. I mean, um, I uh, experienced something very similar to this. Um, very fortunately, um, um, you know, the company was able to uh, acquire uh, um, alternate investment in the business. Um, it was also a, a pre-profit um, business, several years old, but also pre-profit. Um, and um, it's really, really, really tough. Uh, Peter, you know, in these scenarios, um, there are sometimes um, more helpful or less helpful ways of communicating and more helpful or less helpful ways of um, helping people through this kind of scenario. Um, uh, maybe you can give us um, some pointers on what you think might be helpful ways um, to really help people through this scenario. Um, or and even if we do get alternate funding, you know, this is still very much the felt experience of people in that moment where you know you you um, have to make announcements that actually things are not going great. Yeah. Uh, you know that um, there we've encountered these headwinds. So maybe you can take us through some suggestions there around what what are the most helpful ways of communicating and the most helpful ways of supporting. Hundred percent. So, you know, again, just based on on my observations of things, it, candor and clarity of the situation, and saying this is where we're at. Um, it's it's super important that we're as clear and transparent with people as possible. Um, there may be some legal reasons that we can't, for, for for sure. But in in situations, particularly where you know you face investment challenges or um, potentially wind down pot uh, potential it's to be very clear with people where you're at um, and then from a support point of view it's to keep, keep that messaging clear and update regularly because any length of period of, of just no communication people make their own assumptions and and assume that hey you do find another investor and in that in interim period people are what do you think the first thing they're going to do is look for their next job you know they productivity will drop all of these things that you have to consider so you know it's it's business as usual um <laughs> but not and and so how do you do that you've got to communicate carefully you've got to use your leaders to be able to communicate that message to listen to people to listen to their concerns identify risks and in some situations you may be retaining people you may have had to find some money somewhere to spend to retain critical people to at least get you to a point even in a wind down scenario i think you know the fca talks about having critical people identified up front that will help you to get to that and to ensure that there's some 100%. way to keep them around so mm -hmm. so you know in in regulated businesses the these are real things that have to be done irrespective of what the actual situation is so so you know from that point of view then like at an individual level having things like outplacement services so support mechanisms somebody to talk to being available face to face on calls whatever it is um, from a people function point of view this is where we play a massive role is mm -hmm. enabling all of these activities and to help people to cope to go through we talk about the grief cycle and 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 
to work through that. And that could be in a change process. It doesn't have to really be just in this situation. It can be in any big change in an organization. Um, and it's really listening. It's like being there for people, providing them with support, our placement services, employee assistance programs, you know, well-being programs, allowing them time off to interview if that's their job is at risk talking through the legal implications there's there's all sorts of different things that would need to be covered and the, the the more that you talk the more that you you are clear with people about what what things look like and allow them to go through that grief process because you have to acknowledge those emotions um because people go through that and that's okay yeah. and we expect that but it's really about what do we do to support them during that time and and these are the types of things that I would be doing Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think um, we're going to move on uh, from here. Um, and we've got a, uh, just time for one more Zoom poll. Um, so we'd love to get you to weigh in on this one. How would you expect the most senior person or people um, to be involved in any of these growth strategies? So uh, how would you expect your most senior um, HR person or a most senior person to be involved um, in these growth um, scenarios. So be involved in the implementation operations that come down from the board, be involved end to end and as early as possible to ensure people's success or be involved as and when we think they are needed, uh, which isn't all the way through. Um, when would you expect to see the most senior HR or people person uh, be involved. Let's get some expectations and some feedback from people here. Uh, be involved end to end and as early as possible. That's uh, 100%. What do you say, Peter? End to end as early as possible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no um, surprises there. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is. I mean, again, I've been uh, lucky to be involved uh, in most situations where similar situations to this would, would have happened early um, and been trusted to to help. Um, and, and effectively, it's super important because there's just so many people and implications in growth and, and, and restructuring activities. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some other things very quickly to consider when we talk about growth, Peter. Cool. Um, so I, I, I suppose these were just some particular topics that kind of came into my mind when when we go through growth scenarios and and uh, irrespective of growth or, or changes, um, the role of boards and investors um, and and it's maybe one for kind of just open discussion, um, but the roles that different boards and, and investors play um, over a period of time. And so I think about board composition. And in 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 my experiences and what I've I'm seeing in in the market is you know often we find that boards are, are have to be kept quite small, um, and experiences are possibly limited to commercial risk related activities, um, and there's not necessarily uh, people experience uh, in that in that room. So and what do I mean by that? People who have been in people functions as as possibly an example. Um, and how how does that play out? Because if we assume and and we, or we make the thought that people are absolutely critical to the success of the organization, then why is kind of the people part not there? So and I think about if I'm starting out on my journey in 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 HR and I'm in a startup or scale up business, it's quite lonely and do I have somebody I can kind of talk to and who could guide, help guide my thinking? So early, early stage growth, it might actually be quite beneficial if you're going to continue with or have somebody less experienced in the function. It might be helpful to have somebody on the board to be able to help guide and provide support. And so kind of this relates back to kind of my third point as well about people roles and functions. But, you know, these are not just individual situations. They're, they're in, in conjunction with each other. And, and so for me, board and investor makeup is, is an interesting one to consider and think about, uh, particularly from a people aspect. How do you bring in the people function into consideration? Mm. Um, and I've seen this happen at varying times. The CEO or founder or whoever might just present on behalf 
and and give information or the people person comes into it and presents and gets insight and there's a variety of ways of doing this but I, I definitely kind of look at these things and where where I've experienced really positive results is where the people person is involved and so when we talked about kind of end-to-end -end involvement this is this is also super helpful it allows that person to gain insight as to what the board looks at how does it work um, and then kind of culture impacts um, again this one is is quite a big one and, and, and probably a topic in itself um, but I think about how these how different cultures come together so if we looked at the first example we had kind of two probably quite extremely different cultures um, and how how do you get those things to gel in some shape or form and often through uh, acquisition and integration processes you look at culture integration as a specific topic and you identify ways in which you can try and bring them a little bit closer together um, and it's not doesn't mean fundamentally changing everything and the subcultures will exist but it's how do you just get them a bit closer together so they can work more effectively um, and then I, kind of the people roles and functions one is, is obviously an important one for me particularly around the people function or HR function however you want to to term it and how these roles play out over time and so what do you need at a startup what do you need at an acquisition yeah I think we've just... Um, uh, is it different? Uh, sorry, did you lose me a second there? Just for a second, Peter, but you're back. Okay, cool. So yeah, for me, it was really around, this is one I'm very passionate about, is kind of where where people roles play a part in different stages of, of a business that matures and what is it that you might need. Um, so I'm, I'm going to stop there. I think those are just kind of some other topics that might be worth exploring. And maybe there's some questions that we want to, to cover on these things, but... Um, they're, they're ones that immediately came to my mind in a growth scenario in particular. Great. Thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you, Peter. Um, we're going to come off of mute in a little bit um, and um, give everybody an opportunity to ask any specific questions that they may have. Um, but before we do that, um, I just want to fill you in on our next strategy cafe that's coming up. It's going to be on the 25th of April. Um, and continuing on the growth theme, we're going to look at is your boss, is your business model really ready for growth? So um, myself and um, uh, some of my colleagues will be uh, talking a little bit about what does it mean to be ready? Um, how do you assess if you're ready? Um, at what point are you ready for growth or acquisition? Uh, is your team ready for investment or growth? How do you know when growth is not healthy? Uh, and is your model capable? So we're going to be covering some of these areas um, at 8.30 on the 25th of the 4th. So thank you so much. And we look forward to having you join us for that one.